and I walk out there and I'm going to do Chen Tai Chi Chuan and I start the movement and I can just hear the audience falling asleep. Hey, how's it going? This is Whistlekick, Martial Arts Radio, episode 480, with today's guest, Mr. Jeff Kelly. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, your host on the show, founder of Whistlekick, and everything we're doing here is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what we do, hop on over to whistlekick.com. That's our digital hub. It's the place to find the store. And if you use the code PODCAST15, you can save 15% on some gear or uniform or maybe a shirt or hat. Everything for this show is at a different website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where we put up links and photos and videos and all kinds of good stuff. Transcripts, you name it, it's over there for every single episode we've ever done. Yeah, we bring you two episodes a week. We're creeping up on episode 500. We got big stuff in the works. And why are we doing all this? Well, see, we want to educate, entertain, and inspire traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to help the work that we're doing, a couple ways you can do that. You can make a purchase. You can share an episode. You can leave us a review somewhere. Or you can support the Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. And if you contribute five bucks or more, we're going to give you even more stuff. So your thank you comes with more thank you. Like all guests, I really enjoyed talking to Mr. Kelly. We had a great conversation. We talked a lot about his past and the really interesting path that he's been on. Some of the really unique experiences, stuff that frankly made me jealous. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. So here we go. Mr. Kelly, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hi, Jeremy. Good to be here. It's good to have you here. Thank you for your time. Thanks for coming on. And, you know, I wanted to start, uh, listeners, what, what you don't know is that there's a lot of back-end stuff that happens before we bring a guest on. And one of the questions we ask, of course, is around title because, you know, it's a martial arts show. So we try to be respectful of people's titles. A lot of people don't care about them. And quite often we'll have people just say, you know, just call me, call me by my first name. Call me Jeremy. But this was the first time... <laughs> Anyone has answered this question in the way that you did. So under in the box for title, you put Supreme Master of the Known Universe. Just kidding. I'd be happy to explain why I don't really use titles. So I want to start there because <laughs> I, 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 it made me chuckle and, and hopefully it made everyone else chuckle just now. Oh, good. Because that was my goal. Oh, I could tell. I could tell. <laughs> well, on the yeah. topic of, of titles, oh, there's two things. I teach both uh, Filipino martial arts, Pekiti Tersha Kali, and uh, Chen style uh, Tai Chi Chuan. And uh, I have a title with the Filipino martial arts guru, which mean, simply means teacher. Um, and there's various levels of that. And I've never really cared about, about that. I've got permission for my teacher to teach. And that's good enough for me. As far as the Chinese martial arts go, uh, the term is Shifu or uh, in Cantonese Sifu. The problem with that is that it's an honorific. No one should ever call themselves master or surfu or sifu. That's something other people call you. Um, you will have a relationship if you have disciples, and I have one. Uh, you'll have a relationship with them, and uh, the proper form of dress is a surfu. In fact, my uh, disciple, Patty, I don't think she even knows what my real name is anymore. Uh, she calls me Shifu. Uh, as far as the other students, uh, it's up to them. Uh, it's a little awkward for people because they, you know, know me outside uh, the, the studio, perhaps, or the school. And uh, I'm very informal. So uh, I teach a lot of seniors um, with the uh, community college and the local university here. And it's a little weird for them to start calling me master or Shifu or something like that. So I leave it up to them. Um, it's uh, also kind of awkward to, which one do they call me, Shifu or Guru? Uh, I know Dan Asanto, um, he uh, obviously prefers to go by his name, um, but out of respect, uh, I see people uh, using uh, Sifu slash uh, Guru, which just is a little unwieldy. So I tried uh, doing the whole, you know, call me by this title thing. And uh, it really d didn't work too much. Um, you know, if, if people want to call me Sherfield, that's fine. 
The other thing too, speaking as an honorific, um, it, it, it has nothing to do with martial arts per se. Um, I remember one time in China, we were getting on the bus and my friend had to ask the driver a question and he started with Shifu, uh, which way do we go or when will we be there? And I was like, whoa, so this driver's a martial arts master? No, that's just a term that you use for someone who's mastered their craft. It could be a, a chef, it could be a taxi driver. Um, so it's just a, a form of respect for someone who's mastered their craft. Uh, Shrifal actually means uh, father, teacher, um, or actually backward, uh, teacher, father. Um, so when you enter in a formal relationship with that, uh, traditionally you did a little ceremony um, and you, uh, the student brought you some tea and then perhaps a gift and, uh, you know, uh, took some vows. And uh, that's what we did with uh, my disciple or apprentice, Patty. Um, so that's a, this is a very special relationship. Uh, she asked me one time, uh, one time, how long is that? And I said, uh, till death and beyond, um, you, you don't break that. Um, and, uh, so you don't really, um, it, it, again, it's not something that you call yourself. Uh, you know, I had a relationship with my, uh, Shifu, uh, Sushi of the Shaolin temple. And so of course I called him Shifu. When we were talking about other teachers, masters, we'd say your Shurfu or uh, Shurfu so-and-so, which it simply means master so-and-so out of respect. Um, but you can't earn the title. There's no test you can take um, traditionally in Chinese martial arts. So um, it's, it's up to my students. Um, and, uh, they, you know, they want to call me this or that. The, the Goro thing is a little easier for people, um, mostly because I have a stick. And if they don't say it, they're in trouble. Uh, <laughs> but other than that, uh, you know, I'm not going to enforce uh, titles or anything. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting thing. I mean, we're at this, what feels to be this transitional time in traditional arts in that titles and stripes and rank have become so inflated that they're getting diluted. And I'm seeing more and more people step away from them. You know, we've been doing this show close to five years. and. In the first year, even the first couple of years, it was rare for someone to say that they wanted to be called by their first name or, you know, Mr. Or Mrs. But now the majority of people coming on the show, that's what they're asking for. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not quite sure why that would be. Uh, I, I do, uh, I have a lot of respect for um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because they have, uh, made the requirements for a black belt very strict. So if you're a black belt, it's understood that you've gone through uh, quite a vigorous process and that you're worthy of that title. Um, the belt ranking thing, um, it's great if you want to make money. Um, you know, you, you, uh, even with uh, BJJ, you, you have to not only take tests, but you have to put in a certain number of class appearances uh, to get your rank. Um, and that keeps you as a regular student. Um, the other type of ranks, um, you know, you have to, uh, you know, take tests, which is a fee. And uh, if you uh, sometimes to get a stripe, you might might have to take a test. So you you keep the uh, money train rolling in. Um, I'll, it may be obvious throughout uh, this conversation, and I'm very bad with business and money. So uh, there's no interest on my part for doing uh, the ranking thing. Um, it was very um, relaxed to uh, even with the uh, Filipino martial arts, Bikini Tricia, um, uh, getting rank um, because we, it was one school um, and it was run by uh, my friend and mentor and teacher, Tom Bizio, who has uh, appeared on this show. And uh, I remember when one of my uh, classmates uh, was promoted to Goro, uh, Tom just gave him a letter. Um, so uh, that was great. Um, in my case, it was a little different. Um, I'd have to leave New York, and I spent two years back in North Carolina uh, teaching uh, and not being able to study, per se. I think I went up for a, a seminar with uh, uh, Grand Tuan Leo Gai. Uh, 
but we, uh, in fact, it was for a seminar. I went up there. Um, there was a seminar the next day and I'm talking to Tom on the phone and he goes, oh yeah, we got to make some time for your test. And I went, test? We've never done tests before. Oh yeah, you just do some of this, you do some sparring. And I'm like, oh great. <laughs> Thanks for <laughs> letting me know. Um, so next day we're doing it. I don't even remember, uh, except for the sparring. Um, and you know, we're Tom's watching and he knows my abilities, so we're not worried about that. Uh, but in the back of the room is uh Grand Tuhan Gahi, uh, who didn't know me that well. Uh, and uh, I'm looking back there and I'm going, boy, if he shakes his head, no, it's all done. <laughs> but uh, he signed the certificate, so I guess uh, he approved. But uh, we we didn't do any ranks. We we had beginners, we had advanced students, and then we had teachers. Um, I've gone just a little bit different, uh, very slightly, um, more for motivation and for uh, uh, appreciation. Um, I've established that only uh, teachers can wear red shirts. Um, everybody else, we start out in black, although they can wear anything they want. And uh, for those who uh, I've uh, asked to be advanced students, invited to be advanced students, um, they're going to wear a blue shirt. In fact, I'm actually buying them all uh, for this group because they're kind of the uh, plank holders, the first uh, group that have been promoted to uh, advanced students. So a little motivation there with the uh, Chen Tai Jichuan. Of course, there's no ranks whatsoever. Um, but I came up with some pins. I've got some uh, yin yang type pins. And uh, so when they complete one section of the form, they get one pin and then so on and so forth. Um, but that's it. That's just a little, you know, token. Um, the form them itself is uh, tells you whether, you know, how far they are. Uh, and again, that goes back to the master. Um, you know, it's the honorific, but, you, you know, it, Chinese people know. And uh, if the guy's good, he's a master and he deserves that title. If he's not, everybody knows it. So, um, you know, it's uh, just, you know, it's it's based on your, your abilities um, and, uh, you know, People figure it out usually. I like the idea of the pins. I, I've heard a lot of different things to signify progress through the martial arts, but pins, I, I think this is the first time I've heard of that. I, I like that idea. Well, we're trying to avoid the uh, BJJ thing of having advertisements all over the uh, uniforms. <laughs> um, yeah, we came up with, a, I, we wear a different uniform for uh, Chen Tai Juan. Um, it's a little different than most schools wear. So putting uh, patches on it um, just just didn't look right. Um, we have our you know logo on the front, but uh, even putting the pins on the uniform, uh, it just doesn't work. Um, so people just keep them at home. Right on. Now we're talking about Tai Chi, and and you talked about Shaolin Temple, and and you've mentioned Filipino arts. So at some point, and, and now is probably as good a time as any, let's, let's see if we can go back and, and tie a thread through that. And how'd you get, how'd you get there? How did, that's, that's the wrong question. How did you get here and connect all those dots? Best question. There we go. Well, it all started when it started. Uh, I'll give you two words. Billy Jack. Yes. The, uh, the Great movie. movie. Great. Billy Jack. Yeah. Um, my friend and I went to see that. And he just got all uh, hot and bothered and, and went and found the, the uh, basically the only uh, school that existed in Winston-Salem, North Carolina at that time. It was a Taekwondo school, the Kim School of Taekwondo. Um, his, uh, his family was a little better off than mine, so he joined right away. Um, I uh, was making money. I was 14. And I was making money by uh, mowing lawns. And uh, so I saved up the money, enough money to uh, join. And I, I didn't, couldn't afford a uniform. I don't know where I got this, but I had a judo gi. So uh, you can imagine um, summertime with the heat and humidity in a tiny room with no air conditioning and a bunch of people sweating, just how comfortable that was. Mm. Um, and so I, I did for a couple months uh, and then the, the grass stopped growing. And I didn't have any money for lessons. Um, my folks were not interested in uh, subsidizing me. Um, so I went to the teacher and I said, look, I'm, I'm, I don't have any money. I'm going to have to quit. And he said, uh, let me do something. So he, he checked with uh, Master Kim. 
came back to me and said, oh, all right, look, you clean the uh, Dojang and, and you can uh, continue to study. So that's what I did for the next four years. Um, every night I swept the dojo and then uh, Dojang, pardon me, and uh, mopped it once or twice a month um, and very rarely missed a class, uh, at least three times a week. Uh, and that's, uh, I did that until I was 18 and got my black belt. And from there, um, I went to college in Greensboro, North Carolina, and I just took advantage of whatever was around. I did some uh, Okinawan karate for a while, uh, some uh, Japanese jiu-jitsu for one of the uh, professors, um, some Aikido. So whatever was available, um, I just, I did. Um, and uh, so there were, uh, you know, after that was a dry period, I was teaching some Taekwondo and and stuff, but I, I was never really good at it. I'm not very flexible. I can't make the kicks, uh, the high kicks look any good. Um, so it, it wasn't really the right thing for me. Um, what really uh, worked well for me, though, the, the inspiration that I got was not so much from one person, but from uh, Black Belt and Karate Illustrated magazines, uh, because uh, there was no variety in uh, our town. Uh, I would read the magazines, and I was particularly drawn to the more exotic arts, uh, Savat or uh, uh, Panjak Silat. Um, I don't know where I saw something about Chen Taijichuan. Um, I uh, ended up, I, I got some magazines that featured uh, Grand Tuhan Gaihi on them. Um, so uh, eventually, um, in a circ circuitous route, I moved to uh, New York City. And the first thing I did, I had that magazine, and I uh, it said he was teaching at the Filipino consulate. So I think within the first day or two, I went over there asking about him, um, but he'd already moved to Texas. So I was extremely disappointed. Um, and so I was uh, just kind of wandering around going to various martial arts stores in town, as you you would. Uh, and uh, I, I got Dan in the Santos book, uh, The Filipino Martial Arts. And I got a broom handle and uh, I'm trying to figure out how to do this from a book. And uh, amazingly, I, uh, I went into a martial arts store and there was a flyer um, for a, a class and uh, a Filipino martial arts class, Piketty Tertia. What's that? I don't know. So I called the guy up, uh, Tom Bizio. He was very nice to me on the phone. Um, I went uh, to the next class and uh, never left. That was the art for me. You didn't have to be flexible. Um, it was very difficult. Um, I thought my black belt in Taekwondo was going to help me. It did not. Um, the movements uh, are so different. Um, I just felt like a uh, completely out of place for the first year. Um, but that was, uh, that was the beginning of, of that. Um, now, as far as the Chinese arts, um, after a couple of years, uh, things weren't really happening at home. Um, I had gotten a teacher certificate and taught high school for a year and hated it. And then just uh, to deal with boredom, I uh, went to Wake Forest University and took some classes in Chinese language. And liked it, enjoyed it. Um, and then I just thought, well, you know what? I can teach anywhere. Might as well teach in China. And uh, so I talked to my uh, professor and he talked to his professor and they, they got me a job at a, a university in uh, Hunan province, tiny, well, a small town by uh, their standards. And uh, so I, uh, I went there and of course I sought out whatever martial arts I could find, which was you know, mostly wushu. Uh, in fact, the uh, the PE teacher for the uh, university, uh, I worked with him quite a bit because at that time, uh, that was part of their curriculum was martial arts. So he knew the exterior form for a lot of things. Uh, we, we worked on Xing Yi. Um, he taught me the, the first uh, you know, part of the, uh, a shortened Chen version uh, of the form. And uh, some wushu, which were good for basics. Um, and uh, so I spent a year doing that. Uh, and in the meantime, I had one of my friends uh, contact uh, the Chen 
uh, school uh, of uh, Taiji Chuan in uh, Chen Village. And we made arrangements for me to go and study for six months. And, uh, so I moved up to Hunan province, uh, the city of Zhengzhou, uh, which is the biggest city uh, nearby. And uh, so I went out to uh, the Chen village, which at that time was extremely small. Uh, we're talking, uh, you know, uh, dirt main street and uh, mud brick houses and stuff. And uh, the Chen school was the only one there. And it was kind of run down and missing window panes and such. Uh, I, and I believe I was the third foreigner who'd ever studied there. So we went and I, uh, you know, okay, we're going to finish the uh, paperwork here and I can get started at six months because I had just enough money to uh, be able to study there and then enough to live on until I could find a job, uh, which it was pretty easy. You walk into a university and they'll pretty much hire you as a foreigner. Um, unfortunately, when I got there, um, the first thing they tried to do was, uh, you know, oh, the school's not, uh, it's not good enough for foreigners. So you should stay here in the, uh, the county seat town and I will put you in a nice hotel and we'll have one of the masters, uh, Master Chen Zhenglei, come in and teach you, uh, you know, an hour to a day. I was like, no, um, I, I've got plenty of time. I just don't, I don't have much money. I want to go to the school. So we drove out to the school and they, you know, put their heads together and go, well, you know, we, we have to change things a bit. Um, and uh, the price has gone up. So they ended up charging me uh, the, the six months. The price they'd given me would have now just cover one month. Mm. Um, so, you know, I was, I was pretty devastated, um, and went home and thought uh, to where I was staying and thought about it. I said, well, that's better than nothing. Uh, if I'd gone the six months, I wouldn't have had any money to survive on. So, uh, I said, okay, I went back. I said, okay, let's do it. Um, so, uh, I was able to study about a month, um, at the, uh, school. I, I had my own private room. Um, most of the students there were young uh, in their twenties and stuff. I was about 30 at that time. Uh, and I, in fact, I was the oldest, uh, say for one gentleman, um, very nice guy. I don't know. He's forties, fifties. Um, and he was, uh, he was from the North. He spoke beautiful Mandarin, um, because there, there was no English. And luckily I spoke Mandarin. Um, but the problem was they, these were, the teachers were all uh, country folk and they had their own, uh, uh, accent. So this gentleman was kind enough to translate their Mandarin into Mandarin I could understand. So uh, that helped a great deal. Uh, and so uh, we worked um, uh, all together about eight hours a day, uh, six days a week uh, for a month. And so I was able to learn the complete uh, first form of the old style, uh, Lao Jia Yi Lu, and uh, the double edged sword of Jian. And uh, the broadsword or dan dao, um, and uh, uh, the rest of the year, um, I made arrangements with um, the grandmaster Chen Xiao Wang. Um, it was his brother that ran the school, um, and he arranged for me to work with one of his top students, and uh, we worked on the new form, uh, the first form of the new style, Xinjia uh, Yilu. So. Um, that was that was the uh, Chen side of it. Um, now the Shaolin side. If you don't mind me diving right into that. No, no, let's do it. Let's do it. We're 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 you know we're getting the story here, but there's also I mean you're you're giving us a lot of context in a way that we don't often get when people travel overseas and and when they're just kind of students. You know, there's well, there's bits of context here that that's happening that I'm, I'm really enjoying. So please. Well, uh, one of the reasons this happened is because I, I do everything wrong and backwards. <laughs> um, the, the smart thing to uh, have done would be uh, work for an English con uh, company teaching English and they would pay you in American dollars and you'd be in Beijing or something. Well, uh, the school I was at uh, Ling Ling teachers college had never had a foreigner. In fact, in that county, they'd pretty much never seen a foreigner. 
Um, so the conditions were pretty much what everybody uh, else did. They, uh, they had gotten me a Western toilet and they were extremely proud of this because most people um, had a, a hole uh, that uh, often was in the shower. So you'd um, go in the, sh- in the shower in that hole and uh, then you'd take a shower and clean it out that way. So I had my Western toilet, uh, which made life easier. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that, that was difficult, but I, I got, uh, you know, some good, uh, training with the basics and, uh, you know, get better with the language. I actually spoke better and I thought I did, uh, but that's another story. Um, so by living in the country and basically being on my own, um, it made it possible for me to, to, you know, go up and, and study. Uh, the, the Shaolin connection uh, comes out about, uh, so uh, Shaolin is not that far from Zhengzhou either. It's about, uh, well, at that time, it was about a two-hour bus ride because we we're going over dirt roads and such. There were no highways. Um, and so uh, I went out there to check it out. Of course, you got to make the pilgrimage and hated it. Absolutely hated it. There was a, about a half mile road to get to it. The buses drop you off and it was just full of uh, kiosks on either side of the street. People selling really, really cheap weapons and crappy t-shirts. And then we got into the temple. Of course, uh, this was summertime. So there's a huge number of uh, tourists and uh, they had the same kiosks in the temple. They had uh, you know, cheap swords and crappy beads and, uh, all over the temple. And it's, it was just really disgusting. You know, this was, it was not a temple anymore. It was a, uh, a very old shopping mall. Um, so I didn't like it at all. And then, and I thought, okay, well, I've done that. And then I went to the Chen school. Um, and so then, uh, I got a job in Zhengzhou and I was teaching and, um, one day I was in a, a shop buying a sword. I'd given mine away to my teachers in uh, Chen Village. And uh, this gentleman came up to me and uh, wanted to make sure I wasn't being cheated because that was an, not an uncommon uh, occurrence there. When uh, they saw me as a foreigner, they would jack their prices up. Mm. Um, so we got to talking and uh, it, it turns out that uh, you know, when he found out I was a martial artist, he said, well, I write for martial arts magazines. Um, so we got to be good friends. I'd go and visit him and his family. And uh, one day I noticed uh, he had a, a Buddhist statue of Guan Yin. Now, this was extremely rare, um, especially 30 years ago. Um, religion was not um, encouraged, shall we say. Um, so it's pretty brave of him to even have that. And he, and he told me, oh, I'm, you know, I'm a disciple of Shaolin Temple. You want to go out there sometime? I'm, sure. Okay. Well, he showed up at my door one day a couple of weeks later um, and said, hey, the, uh, the Shaolin monks are doing a demonstration in Luoyang. Do, do you want to go? Oh, yeah, sure. I want to go. So we got over um, to the temple, uh, which had finally gotten rid of all their... Um, trinket sellers. Um, so it was more like a temple. And we stayed over there, uh, one of his friend's place. And so we're getting on the bus the next morning to go over to Luyan. And I get on the bus and I look around and it's full of Shaolin monks. And uh, they were very nice, very welcoming. Um, we got to talking and uh, they found out it was martial artists and they said, oh, you've, you've got to demonstrate with us. You, you know, you've got to show your martial arts. Like, oh, no, I couldn't really. Oh, no, you must. They really insisted. So I'm thinking, okay, well, um, I've got the Chen Tai Chi I can do. Fine. And they said, oh, no, you have to do two. You have to do another performance. It's like, well, um, I guess I could do some Pikiti Tertia. We don't really have forms, but, um, you know, I can fake something. So they took a staff and cut it in half. So I had two um, sticks, approximately the correct. Uh, length. So uh, we're all set there. So I'm, I'm watching from the wings at the performance and it's absolutely amazing. 
These guys are you know, punching and kicking with power and speed. And then they've got some hard Qigong where they're heating up uh, bars, uh, red, you know, hot bars and putting them on their tongues and breaking things over their heads and spears in their neck. And the crowd's just loving it. And so they introduce me and I walk out there and I'm going to do Chen Tai Chi Chuan and I start the movement and I can just hear the audience falling asleep because suddenly here I'm doing this slow motion thing. So I cut it down to, at the first opportunity to get out of it. Um, I caught, cut it down. I probably did uh, 10, 20 movements uh, just so I could get out of there because they weren't here to see me. Mm. Um, and then later for the second performance, um, I did the sticks, uh, double stick. Again, we have no form, so I was just freestyling. And you don't know, it doesn't look like much. So they probably all thought I was just waving a stick around. Uh, so that wasn't too impressive. Although what came out of that eventually is one of my Dharma brothers, uh, the young, uh, Shishun, uh, actually asked me about it one time and wanted to learn it. And uh, he said, show me the form. I said, well, we don't have forms. And uh, the idea of having him do hundreds of repetitions of one strike and of footwork and stuff, that wasn't going to go over. That's not how the the Chinese mindset works. Uh, So we did the performance, and uh, my friend Wang Bin said, oh, would you like to meet my teacher? Oh, sure. All right. So we go and meet him, and he says, would you like to become a disciple? I'm like, "Uh, yeah. And I had no idea what was involved. So we're in a little hotel room. And uh, I have a picture of this in my blog. And there I am kneeling on the floor. And uh, this master is uh, making me a Buddhist disciple. And uh, also, you know, one of his disciples. Well, come to find out, um, my master now was uh, one of the most famous Shaolin monks in the country. Uh, uh, I should say the most famous. Um, Really loved by people. Everybody wanted to be his disciple. And he didn't take that many. Um, his name was uh, Dharma Master uh, Shur Su Shi. And I should point out, too, that uh, Shur, as a what we would call last name, is all monks have that last name. It's uh, short for Shujamuni or Sakyamuni, the original Buddha. Um, so all monks have that as their uh, family name. And I, I really want to point out that no one who is not a, a uh, ordained monk should use that as their name. They should use their own family name. So um, I was given a Buddhist name, De Qin, which means uh, overflowing with virtue. And then I kept my, my Chinese family name, which is Ke, or you know, uh, an abbreviation or a, a translation of Kelly, as uh, best I could do. So I would be Ke De Qin, not sure De Qin. And I see a lot of that being abused. Um, so unless you're an actual practicing monk, you shouldn't use that as a name. So anyway, I became a 31st generation lay disciple of the Shaolin can, can Temple. I yeah, jump in on something? You, and if you're going to get there, by all means, keep going where you're going. But you expressed the standing that this man has and that mm-hmm. he doesn't take, or, or at least wasn't taking very many disciples on. Right. But he took you on without from what I heard, you even fully understanding what that meant. Mm-hmm. So I want to know why. Uh, it was all due to Wang Bin. Okay. Wang Bin was a, a lay disciple as well. And uh, he was respected and Shifu liked him a lot. Um, so it was only because he interceded that he took me on. And that came, uh, that held true later on. Um, I met uh, uh, this gentleman from Denmark, uh, Thomas Engby. And uh, he had gotten a raw deal um, studying with a training center. And uh, it was a good, seemed like a really good kid. And uh, so I talked to Shifu and I said, he'd like to be disciple. And uh, Shifu said, okay. And he has been an incredible disciple his whole life. Um, and then later on, we met uh, a couple guys from Australia. And uh, since Thomas had become a si- disciple, they asked me if I would, asked Sherpa about that, and he accepted them as well. Um, So it was simply because of uh, Wang Bin that I was able to become a disciple. 
And the other thing was that um, I wasn't interested in Shaolin martial arts. When I had moved to China, uh, I knew two things. I wanted to study Taoism, and I did not want to do Shaolin because it, to me it was more like Taekwondo. I wasn't flexible and, and such. Uh, so wasn't really interested in that. I wanted to do uh, Chen, Tai Chi Chuan. So um, it was because I was more interested in um, Buddhism that I think Shifu uh, accepted me. Um, and then I you know, would go every opportunity um, to Shaolin and, uh, you know, just try to study Buddhism or at least be present. It was really difficult to study. Um, I didn't have the vocabulary for that uh, level of uh, philosophy. Um, but I ended up learning Shaolin martial arts um, in a very interesting way. Um, again, Wang Bin uh, talked to some of the monks and he said, hey, this guy is a martial artist. Would you teach him something? And so he said, oh, they're going to teach him. So we went to their practice area. And so one of the monks is there and he's going to start teaching me. And I can just tell that he does not want to do this. He does not think that I'm serious. You know, he really doesn't want to waste his time teaching me. So he, he taught me a little bit, very begrudgingly. And then I went home and I practiced every day um, and for a week. And in fact, I actually had a dream about one of the movements and how it could be used. So when I back, went back the next week, uh, he saw that I'd practiced. And again, I want to emphasize I have no natural ability, but I had the, the proper attitude. And uh, he saw that I had practiced. I told him about this dream. He was impressed with that. And so he became very happy to teach me. In fact, uh, by the time the year was over, monks were coming to me to teach me uh, different st forms and weapons and uh, way more than I could actually process. Uh, in fact, one of the monks uh, started to teach me a, 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 what he described as a secret form uh, using the prayer hands where the, the hands are you know, placed together, palms together. I didn't get the whole thing, but uh, yeah, it was uh, whether I, <laughs> I guess it was just fated to be. Um, but I, I honestly think it, one is because I spoke Chinese and, and you, you just can't, you know, People are not going to, there's no one to translate at that time. And because I was, uh, you know, a genuine, uh, wish for I was genuinely interested in uh, studying uh, Buddhism. Uh, in fact, I went on to um, take uh, what's known as the Bodhisattva precepts. Um, this is a pure Buddhist thing where you um, vow to a, a form of conduct, conduct. And you vow to become a bodhisattva, which is a being that um, vows to put off final enlightenment until uh, and, and to try to benefit mankind and, and uh, uh, puts off a final enlightenment until all beings are enlightened. Uh, again, he, his, uh, his disciples, uh, he, he, he wouldn't let them do it. He asked me, he said, I want you to go take this, this uh, uh, ceremony, the, these uh, precepts. And he had not let any of his monk disciples do this. Um, so when they heard I was doing it, of course, they went, they went up to Sherpa and said, oh, you, you know, you let Jeff, you've got to let us do it. Um, so they did. So we went to the original first temple in China, the uh, Baimas, uh, the White Horse Temple, and spent a week uh, taking these uh, precepts. Um, but, you know, I again, uh, I think it was the uh, sincerity there. Um, and so I, I ended up learning martial arts and Buddhism and, and having the incredible um, good fortune to become a uh, lay disciple of the temple. And uh, I think it was all due to uh, the respect and, and uh, genuine uh, interest in, in what was going on. That's some great stuff. I mean, it's, it almost sounds book or movie worthy. I mean, it's quite the <laughs> journey for a Westerner. I mean, it seems like it, at every point you're talking about these things that, that most people don't get the opportunity for. And I would imagine that even in those moments, you were aware 
of these opportunities and, and how fortunate you are. Yeah, but you know what? It was, um, it was cool. But, uh, you know, I, I never traded on that. Um, I never tried to um, uh, make a big deal out of it because to, to me it was, uh, again, it was uh, a process that was not, uh, I, I wasn't doing it for that. Um, in fact, I, I've really never taught uh, Shaolin and Chuan, Shaolin Fist, um, for two reasons. One, I was only there a year, and I didn't feel like I scratched the surface. You know, I, I learned a bunch of forms, but I, I never got deeper than that. That's the Chinese way. So I, I didn't feel like I could really offer the entire art. And uh, one of my uh, my brothers, um, the term is uh, Shushun, um, but one of my Dharma brothers had said, he said, don't just teach anybody. You have to make sure they're proper character. Um, so ju don't just teach anyone. So um, I never traded on that. I, uh, I, you know, I'd written articles in, uh, in Black Belt magazine about the, the temple and stuff. Um, but it, um, it just seemed like the right thing. You know, I mean, of course, it was cool and everything, but... Uh, I wasn't so interested in the reputation of being a disciple um, as it was just being there with Shurfu and with my Dharma brothers. And they would come when they were traveling, they'd come and stay with me at my apartment. And, um, and the, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get upset about this. So. Okay. Yeah. Take your time. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I think the happiest I've ever been was one day it was uh, winter time and there was snow on the mountains and uh, it was cold we were, but the sun was out and uh, i was sitting with next to shifu at his uh, apartments just sitting there looking at the mountains being warm and he was uh, reciting uh, some super sutras um, mumbling the sutras uh, and just sitting next to him was probably one of the most content uh, times of my life and so to me, just being there um, with Shifu and uh, my brothers, uh, that's what it was all about. The, the martial arts were fun. I mean, I'm a martial artist. I'm never going to not do that. Uh, but uh, it, was, it was more just being a part of that. They never treated me differently. Um, and they would say, you know, all, all people are the same. So I felt extremely comfortable there. It's a beautiful Obviously, beautiful, beautiful temple. Um, and so I spent as much time as possible just to be there. It was peaceful. It was beautiful. Uh, I had good friends. and uh, I had my, my teacher. Um, so to me, it was uh, special, but not special. And then coming back, you know, some, not everybody knows <laughs> about Shaolin. Uh, you bring it up at a party and everybody says, oh, what? Oh, you remember the David Carradine uh, show? <laughs> yeah, it looks nothing like that. There's no black rooms with candles. Um, but uh, so I, I never just I never tried to, um, you know, uh, use that for for my own gain. It was uh, I don't think that's in the keep in keeping with the tradition of the temple. I, I've tried to be a good disciple. Um, I'm not, I've, you know, made a lot, uh, it could be a lot better. Um, but, uh, to capitalize on it, um, just seems to me to be wrong. Um, and things have gotten bad. I mean, the government gets involved. It's, uh, it's no longer the independent, um, uh, place of, uh, cultivation that it used to be. Uh, and you, you've got these uh, traveling groups of monks who are doing performances and such, and uh, most of them are not monks. You may get one uh, these days, probably not any. These are, are, are martial artists who have trained in training facilities, and they can do the common forms, and they do them very well. But they're not monks, and they represent themselves as monks. And what they'll do is the martial artists will go and find a... a uh, teacher Shaolin and get a, a Buddhist name so they can use that and then they show, shave their heads. And then they run around the United States um, drinking, uh, 
and smoking and eating meat and, uh, you know, picking up on women. And people go, oh, well, that's what a Shaolin monk is. Um, and it's not. And even though, you know, I'm not a monk, I've taken some advanced vows, uh, uh, precepts uh, that you try to hold to. Um, and that's just not how you, you act. So my hope is that I can represent Shaolin as it was and be true to the temple and to uh, Shurfu. And uh, hopefully he's not, <clears throat> he's not too mad at me now. Hmm. Let's switch gears. Cause you just, you just opened yourself up pretty well. And, and I don't want to, <laughs> it's all right. I don't want to throw anything else in there. I appreciate your, your trust with me and with this audience and sharing that so, so deeply. Let's, let's come forward. Let's talk about now. And, you know, we, we heard about what you're doing and, and some of the things that you're teaching, but I want to connect these two kind of stories that you've told today, you know, the now and what you're doing with how you got there. You know, we, we opened the show with a little bit of a joke, you know, this, this sarcastic uh, title that you would put down in your form. But I think that these two pieces that we're talking about likely, you know, whether you want to think of it as, you know, the duality of yin yang or, or, or something like that. I think that we're seeing, you know, two very distinct sides of you, you know, you're sharing as an instructor and, and here this, um, this value of belonging to a community. And, and these are, you know, these are universal experiences, this desire to belong and this desire to share, or to, to, to spread uh, what we've acquired, what we've learned. How has your past and this, this belonging, this experience of a culture that most of us will, will never be part of, how has that impacted what and how, I think more importantly, the how you teach today? How did your experience in China affect who you are as a teacher now? Well, it absolutely does. And uh, the real benefit of uh, studying over there is you see how it's perceived. And uh, here in this country, we tend to think of uh, everything Chinese as magic. Um, if you study at Shaolin, you're a magic fighter. And such, and that's not the way it's approached there. Um, it's not a big deal. It's just, you know, this is what you do. Um, and these people that, uh, that, that well, the Chinese expression is to cherku or eat bitter. Uh, these people who've devoted their life to training are exceptional, but uh, that's because that's what they do. Um, so uh, I've un I understand that it is hard work. It's nothing magical. Um, so you have to put in the time, you have to put in the effort, nothing comes easy. Um, and uh, again, I'm a, a traditionalist, so it's, uh, I feel the duty to um, teach as it should be taught. This is especially true with uh, Chen, Chen Taiji Chuan, um, because I've, uh, I'm a, uh, an 11th generation um, student not a disciple, a student, of uh, Chen Taiji Chuan, which is an unbroken line, uh, 300 years to back to the founder, Chen Wanting. So what I teach is what has been taught for 300 years. Uh, there have been, obviously, um, improvements or, or uh, evolution. Uh, but just recently, um, I found a book that was a translation um, of a book written by uh, a gentleman who's renowned as the, you know, the, the teacher of the four current grand, grandmasters. Um, he really helped the art survive and, and grow. Uh, his name is uh, uh, Chen Zhao Pi. And um, he wrote this book, and it was published in 1935. And uh, he does, you know, step-by-step directions, how to do the movements. You've got a you know, picture of the final movement. 
And so I, I took this book and I went to class and um, I said, okay, students, I want you to do this movement. It's uh, the sec- uh, third movement that we do uh, called lazily tying clothes. And so I said, okay, do, do this movement. They all did the movement just the way I've taught them. And then I took the book and I said, okay, follow these instructions. And I read them right out of the book from 1935. And uh, it was exactly what I've taught. Now, I hadn't read that book until that week. Uh, but it was exactly what I taught. So I told them that they're doing what was, has been done uh, since at least 1935 and a generation before that, because uh, this gentleman had to learn from somebody. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, nowadays, a lot of uh, different uh, types of Chen on the internet and YouTube. You can see all kinds and uh, you have performance and you have new frame, to old frame. Uh, Every teacher does it differently. And I used to try to point out to uh, students, well, when you're seeing this, this is what's going on. We're seeing that, you know. And now I just tell them, okay, well, whatever they do is fine. You know that what you're doing is authentic and uh, stretches back to the beginning. So everything else anybody else does is fine, but you know, you can rest assured that you are learning authentic Chen Taiji Chuan. Now, by the same token, I can't train people the way they do in China. You know, I can't um, have people do one movement for six months until they uh, are are satisfactory. I I can't (laughs) beat people with switches or make them kneel down for a half an hour on concrete. Um, I mean, you could, but you you wouldn't you wouldn't have students for very long. No, it's tough enough to find students. (laughs) And the thing, too, with uh, Chen, you know, it's the original form, and it's, it is a martial art. Um, and all the other forms of Tai Chi are descended from it. Um, uh, Yang, Wu Hao, uh, Wu uh, Sun. And if you look at the uh, birthdays of the founders, you can see that it goes in that line. Um, so this was it developed as a martial art. And what happened over time is... Um, that some of the uh, uh, aspects of it were, were de-emphasized um, in uh, Chen. Uh, you have um, punches and kicks, and they're done, you know, with power. Uh, you have jumps. You have uh, stretches uh, uh, going all the way to the ground. And they're all designed um, as a martial art. And what's fascinating to me um, is that, you know, I have been without a teacher for 30 years. Uh, just where I lived and my financial state, I wasn't able to get any more training. Um, so no one's showed me what these applications are. But I've uh, discovered on my own uh, a lot of the applications. And, and what's fascinating is that to be effective, they have to be done exactly as done in the form. When I was in China, I asked my teachers, oh, hey, show me some of the applications. They said, no, just practice the form. And now I understand the wisdom of that, um, that, you know, you have to do it exactly as the form and then it'll work. And if you make changes, it doesn't. And you have to be at a higher level of training because I'll show these applications to my students and, and they can't make them work, which was my experience in China as well when I was studying all the students in the village, you know, uh, school. And we asked our teacher, hey, show us an application. And he finally gave up. He showed us one. And he went around the room cranking on everybody. And, oh, God, it hurt. Uh, and then we tried it, and none of us could make it work. And uh, on a side note, one of the uh, Chinese students got so upset, he challenged the teacher. And the teacher said, uh, you know, basically the equivalent of uh, come at me, bro. <laughs> And uh, the guy rushed at him, the teacher tossed him across the room, and uh, we never questioned him again. Hmm. It's fascinating. It really is. You know, there's so much discussion in the martial arts community, in the traditional community about application, you know, in Japanese, bunkaya, I don't know what the word would be in other languages, but the, the importance of it. And I think all too often we forget that if you're not able to call upon that application when needed, 
your understanding of it is useless. And so that's kind of where my, my mind was going when you're talking about the, to some of us, excessive repetition, the perfectionism that you were experiencing, which, you know, the, the little bit that I've come to understand of what training in China is like from, from guests on this show, it's, it's those two things is that there was a lot of volume of training and that it was very exacting. And my, yeah. to my mind, as you discover the application, you, you talk about this, that it came from, you know, your own understanding. But I would imagine that your ability to use it is that much greater because those movements are so deeply instilled. Yeah, what's fascinating, I think you go through stages. Um, you know, you have to master the form. Um, and then, you know, you do have to do some sensitivity work, put what was called pushing hands. The problem I have with that is uh, people think that's the be all and end all. Um, and they actually have contests now of uh, pushing hands, which basically is, uh, you know, poor wrestling. Um, and that's not what it's supposed to be at all. It's working with a partner to develop sensitivity. So you have to have a certain amount of that. And uh, once you do, and you have to master the very basic concept of uh, what's known as silk reeling energy, um, that is very simple to learn, but incredibly um, detailed and incredibly useful. And then when you do get to the applications, what we've we found is uh, one of the other aspects that tells you that this is correct is that they are absolutely effortless. In fact, uh, I, I've been, uh, I tossed my apprentice across the room one time and I said, come on, you're fake. No, no, that was real. And then she tossed me across the room one time. And you got to remember, she's about, you know, five, 420 pounds. <laughs> and she was like, oh, you're faking. I know. And she said, well, I didn't do anything. Um, so, uh, you, you know, that's the, two of the criteria is that it has to be exactly like the form. Because you'll see people on the internet and stuff, and they're doing uh, so-called applications, but they don't do the entire movement. They'll take a piece out of it. And uh, that's very obvious. Um, but uh, and I've wrote some, I've written some uh, guidelines. I put some guidelines together on how to, to figure out applications. Uh, I've got it on my uh, blog, but uh, hopefully I'll, I'll do a, a podcast like this talking about it um and uh, it's it's a matter of self-discovery um and uh you know th there's a lot of concept we, you mentioned yin and yang earlier and thank you so much for pronouncing it correctly <laughs> i try i do try <laughs> there's there's no yang sound in mandarin so no uh, oh that, okay oh yeah so there there actually is a right way oh absolutely right. yeah it's a it's a language you no, know, Yang is correct, and you, I've heard you in the past pronounce Tai Chi correctly. It is G, not Chi. Um, and that's from a misunderstanding of the transliteration system. It looks like Chi. So people think that the word is related to uh, the internal energy, the, the vital energy of the body and of the universe. That's not it at all. In fact, Tai Chi has nothing to do with martial arts. It's a Taoist concept. It means grand ultimate. And it's um, the concept of uh, from going from nothingness to, to something, going from no form to form. Um, and it's a very common term in, in Taoism. Uh, and it, no one in, who spoke Chinese would confuse the two, because if you look at the characters, they're very different. So if you're looking at the characters for Tai Chi or Tai, tai Chi, um, which wouldn't make any sense. Uh, you wouldn't make that mistake. Um, and, and that's another aspect of uh, Chen, Chen Tai Ji Chuan, too, is that uh, it does incorporate uh, more than just the physical. You know, there are um, uh, philosophical elements. The, the founder, Chen Wan Ting, actually took movements that already existed that were part of external martial arts at, at practice at the time. And what he did was he brought in the concepts of internal energy, qi, um, Chinese medicine, qigong, breathing, and uh, created this 
this art. And so I like to demonstrate to people how, um, how deep it goes. Uh, the very first movement is called opening movement. And it's simply uh, taking a shoulder wide stance and the arms raise up and come back down again. Uh, fairly similar, I'm sure, to a lot of other martial arts. But what I like to do is show my students that this actually represents the uh, Taoist cosmology, going from nothing, the Wuji, to the beginning of form, the potential for all things, the Taiji, which the one, which then gives birth to the two, yin and yang, which gives birth to the three, uh, heaven, earth, and humankind, which gives birth to the 10,000 things. And I can show all of that to you in one movement. In fact, I did do a, a video on that on our YouTube channel. Uh, but that just gives a, a demonstrates that just how deep and how rich the art of Chen Taiji is. And that's, again, something I point out getting back to the martial arts aspect. It's hard to learn. It's very exacting and it's complicated. Um, and that's one of the reasons it's not as popular. Um, what most people think of as Tai Chi is the Yang style, uh, which is derived from Chen. They took out the heart movements. It's much simpler. Um, so I always tell my students, uh, you know, first of all, the reason it's so complicated is because it is martial art. And I have incredible respect for them. Anybody who comes back for a second or third class, uh, I have a lot of respect because they're doing something that is not easy. And a lot of my students are uh, in their 70s and 80s. And uh, I got them in there before they knew what they were getting into. Uh, but they, they've accepted it and they really enjoy it. And they're up to the challenge. They like the challenge. Um, you know, they could be doing young and uh, other styles that would be a lot easier. Uh, but it's, um, again, that gets back to, you know, you don't gain gong fu. You don't gain skill. Uh, without a lot of hard work and dedication. That's a well-articulated statement. Thank you. And and I appreciate that. And it it might not seem as as poignant if uh, if you don't know that that kung fu can refer to far more than simply martial arts. Exactly. It's a uh, a skill. Uh, yeah. derived from hard work and dedication. So uh, a great pianist has Kung Fu. A great martial arts has Kung Fu. A, uh, a great chef has Kung Fu. Uh, and that's the ultimate uh, goal is not just to be able to do a pretty form, but to develop that uh, sum that is greater than the parts that we call Kung Fu. Hmm. Let's turn our eyes to the future. You know, it sounds like you've got some some good stuff going on and and challenging yourself. Anyone who is years later, you know, with, without, um, you know, without anyone telling them to, discovering things out of their own training is clearly dedicated and thoughtful and many other things that I wish all martial artists were. So when you uh, look, f go, go ahead. No, you, you were leading somewhere. Go ahead. When you look into the future, when you look over the next, you know, couple of years, five years, ten years, how, however long you want to work, you want to look out. What's what's the goal? What are you hoping? You know, if we if if I gave you a time machine and you could fast forward the next however many years and see where you are then, what would you hope happened? Oh, to become master of the entire known universe. <laughs> okay. Uh, what would your second goal be? <laughs> <laughs> well, the goal in martial arts wise is to come up with a, a studio that is an all in one multidiscipline type school. I mean, personally, I practice both Chen Tai Ji Chuan, which we could describe as yin and then the Filipino martial arts, um, Pekiti Tersha Kali, which is about as different as you can get. Mm, um, you know, Chen Tai Chi Chuan is about cultivation and, you know, maybe in 10 years you can use these techniques. Uh, Pikiti Tertia is when you have to get in a fight tomorrow. Um, so the two complement each other. That's uh, Pikiti Tertia would be young. And the reason I do them both is uh, 
you know, several reasons. One, Bikiti, you have to have partners. Um, Chen, you can do by itself. But I find the two complement each other. The way that, uh, pardon me, the way that uh, Chen can develop um, power in, in the close range, I find is really beneficial to uh, Pikiti Tertia. And Pikiti Tertia has helped me learn some of these um, applications um, by having, you know, we, we do all sorts of arm wrist locks and such. Um, but, and that helps me to look at some of the movements and go, go, okay, all right, this may be part of that uh, movement or, or application. So I find the two complement each other. Um, you know, when I, when I can, I also teach Muay Thai because uh, that's a lot of fun. And, and as a self-defense, I think that's one of the, the best forms of self-defense out there because you're hitting stuff all the time and being hit. Um, and, uh, you know, a few proper Muay Thai techniques will usually end most conflicts. So with my school, I, I would like to do that. Um, I would, you know, I'd want to teach Chen in all its, uh, the, the complete uh, aspects So the, First form, the second form, uh, the weapons, the five major weapons, pushing hands, applications, and then going on to, you know, the new frame. Um, you know, I want to teach Bikita Tertia. Uh, I haven't had any um, a teacher in that in 30 years. Uh, I just recently went to a seminar in Los Angeles at uh, Dan Ensano School and made the pilgrimage to uh, that uh, famous place. And had a seminar with Grand Tuan Guy, so I'm trying to improve my uh, abilities there. I'd like to teach Muay Thai. I think that has a lot of uh, appeal, uh, especially with um, young kids. Um, I would like to add uh, Italian fencing. My wife's a, uh, a fencing master of the Italian uh, fencing school. Um, I'd like to add uh, Corita Australian wrestling. Um, it's very little known art. It's uh, part of the Aboriginal culture that has been revived. And it turns out there's a guy here in Corvallis that uh, knows it. Hmm. Uh, we haven't connected yet, but uh, I'd like to do that. Uh, you know, Penjak Silat, any kind of rare and unusual martial art, I would like to have all under one roof. Now, unfortunately, this is a, a fairly small town, fairly small population, so uh, it's going to be more difficult. Uh, but, you know, as they say, if you build it, they will come. And uh, so I want to, you know, spread that uh, martial art lifestyle and give people something other than the Taekwondo street uh, down the street, you know, traditional things. Um, you know, the, the catchphrase I'm starting to use in my uh, social uh, stuff is that, uh, martial arts are for life and that has two meanings martial arts are life for life that's something you should you do for the rest of your life if you you know have the right situation the right teacher right art and martial arts are for life they are to make your life better and uh certainly i haven't uh made a lot of money at the martial arts but they have been the uh thread throughout my life and now at uh, the age of 61 i'm uh, starting to teach again i'd never had a school before i would teach um, here and there uh, but now we uh, have a studio we're running space in a nice studio and developing more students um, so it took me you know 59 years to finally uh have the confidence to to start teaching others. So it's been a, a you know, I'm, I lost about 17 years of my life. And so now it's a, it feels really good to get back to uh, where I should be. Um, you had uh, my teacher, Tom Bizio uh, on the show way back when. Yeah. 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 Episode 98. 90, oh, good for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I was in New York, I told myself that, to be successful in life, I sh in martial arts, I should do whatever Tom does. And it took that long, 35 years, to finally get to that point. So 
he's not doing a, a Filipino martial arts anymore, but that's part of who he, he is and was. And uh, now I'm doing internal martial arts uh, like him, not Bagua, but Taiji. Um, he's an acupuncturist and I've uh, gone through acupuncture school and uh, he's an expert in Qigong and I uh, have a specialty certificate in Qi- medical Qigong. So finally it's come full circle. Um, and one, just as an aside, a fascinating yeah. thing that just happened. So Corvallis is about a population of about 60,000 people. And when I was in New York, New York, I had a training partner and uh, we, we really uh, trained all the time and we hung out together and uh, he moved and, and I lost track of him. Um, and so a couple of weeks ago, we we're having a Petit class. And this gentleman walks in the door and, hey, I'd like to watch the class. And I I go up and introduce myself. And he looks at me and says, Jeff, it's Sid. And it was my training partner. And uh, completely random. Yeah. And I I screamed like a teenage girl and hugged him so hard. We almost (laughs) went to the ground um, out of of nowhere. And turns out he was born and raised here and uh, moved back about three years ago. Oh, that's that's a riot. Oh, that's. That's beyond coincidence <laughs> to me. That just, if, if, you, if you were to calculate the math required, there's, there's a reason there, as far well, as I'm Bo- concerned. In Buddhism, we'd say it's karma. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I think just having him here, and he, he hasn't practiced in 35 years, although I keep telling him, yeah, you'll, it, you'll get it back. And he, he has it, you know, he's getting it back really quick. But just having him here, I think, will be a tipping point in a, a positive way. Um, not that we have advanced students, but just if that can happen, then hopefully other people can, can find us. Absolutely. And if people do want to find you, there, there's a segue that I couldn't have planned any better, that I just ruined by calling attention to it, but I was really excited for it. If people want to find you, you know, website, social media, email, any of that, how, how would they do so? Uh, well, our website is um, www shilinmartialarts.com. And if I can just mention the, the name Shilin, um, it's unusual, you know, people would um, call it by the city or, you know, Northwest martial arts or something, or I, I thought, you know, you, I could call it Kelly martial arts, but that sounds more like an Irish bar. Um, I would go to that bar. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a great time. Yeah. You know, watch MMA fights. And, um, but I went with Shilin for two reasons. Um, it translates as uh, Western Forest, Shilin. Um, so to me, that kind of represents the, the Northwest where we are, Oregon. And the other thing is that it sounds like Shaolin. Uh, the Lin is the same forest. And uh, Shaol means uh, small. And Shi means Western. And so to me, it has kind of a, you know, a, se- a similar sound. So that's my way of honoring Shaolin, I definitely would not have the hubris to call uh, my school Shaolin, um, even though I do have a scroll um, that Shifu uh, signed and that gives me permission to teach uh, Shaolin martial arts. Um, so I have pretty good uh, pedigree there, but calling uh, my school Shaolin, I think, is uh, a little presumptuous. So to honor Shifu in the, in the Shaolin temple, I've called it Shilin. Uh, or XMA for the uh, millennials. Mm-hmm. So uh, that uh, the website there on social media or uh, social media, it's at Shilin. It's X I L I N. And uh, YouTube, we've tried to put together a number of uh, tutorials in Gidi uh, Tersha, in Shen Tai Ji Chuan, and in Qigong, General Qigong. Nice. And then uh, I'm on uh, uh, Instagram and Facebook at uh, at Sheelin Martial Arts. So if they can get the spelling of Sheelin, they should be able to find it. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, if anybody gets stuck, we'll link all this stuff at the show notes. No worries there. This has been great. This has been been quite the ride. You know, we, we, we went in a bunch of different directions, and that's my favorite thing about this show. But I want to close it up now. So... You've listened to the show. You know we do this almost every single time. Mm-hmm. What parting words would you give to the folks listening? 
Well, I would say the guiding principle for me, and I, I did get this from Tom as well, is to be open-minded, to learn and share. A lot of uh, martial artists are so involved in what they do that they can't see anything else. Um, and uh, Tom would always have uh, seminars with anybody, other styles of Filipino martial arts, uh, dirty boxing, uh, internal martial arts. Um, and I've tried to carry that through of uh, going to seminars in, you know, ninjutsu and Wing Chun and Muay Thai and all those things. And for me, uh, the idea is that a, uh, the tide raises all boats. And so I have no problem uh, promoting other schools. I like to do that. And, and perhaps I'll even get around to doing that on a, a podcast of interviewing the martial artists in this community. Uh, because I just think it makes it better. And there's so many martial arts um, that, they're, you know, they're not for everybody. Uh, and any individual art is not necessarily the right one for you. So by being open-minded, you can find the right one. And then when you have your art, your core art, um, by being open-minded and trying other things, it can add to your own experience. Uh, and this, you know, basically is the Jeet Kune Do concept of Bruce Lee, of having a core art and studying others from beginning to end and adding that into your personal style. So I, I would like people to be uh, open-minded uh, and share what they've learned and not keep it for themselves. That's the, the real benefit of studying in America versus uh, overseas is uh, overseas they tend to be really um, stingy with the information they give out. And in America, we pay dues and we expect to be given the, the whole thing. Um, so you know, we, we have an incredible t opportunity today, especially too with, you know, YouTube and, and uh, other social media to see a, a variety of martial arts. Um, if, you know, when I have the, uh, the student base for it, um, I'm going to bring in whoever I can find to do seminars. Um, even if you don't follow it, I mean, uh, you know, I did a Wing Chun. I'm not a Wing Chun guy, but I learned a lot from it. Um, you had Stephen Hayes on here. I had a seminar with him when he was just starting. It was uh, very eye-opening. I'm not going to do ninjutsu, but I got to meet Stephen right. and uh, meet him again a few years ago. Uh, and that has really, uh, you know, benefited me as a martial artist. So be open-minded. Try things. You don't have to give up what you're doing. It doesn't mean that what you're doing is less than anything else. Um, but all those things can add to your life, your experience, and your martial arts career. See what I mean? This guy's been on an interesting path. I mean, there's just, there's stuff going on there that I never would have imagined. And I don't know, I, I keep coming back to this idea that it feels like his life came out of a martial arts movie. And I don't say that disparagingly. That's not at all how I mean it. I mean that genuinely. And I'm jealous. So, Mr. Kelly, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate your time. Had a great time talking with you. If you want to find out more, if you want to check out photos and links and all that good stuff, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you haven't signed up for the newsletter, you should do that too. That continues to grow. We keep putting more and more into it. And that website's the easiest place to sign up for it. And if you're down to support everything that we're doing, and I hope you are, a couple ways you can do that. You can visit the store at whistlekick.com and use the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. Yeah. Or you can leave a review, you can buy a book on Amazon, or help out the Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. Our social media is Whistlekick. <laughs> and my email is jeremy at Whistlekick.com. That's it. Thanks for your time today. Until our next episode. Train hard, smile, and have a great day.